I'm so glad to have you here on Unleashed. Man, it just, every week I can't wait to get these podcasts out there. And there's so many of you that I've been able to develop relationships with through, you know, emails or questions that come through the podcast. You know, what's really been cool is I have been so busy traveling and speaking the last three or four weeks. And everywhere I've traveled, whether it's New York, Wisconsin, Louisiana, Southern Indiana, you name it, guys have been coming up and saying, man, I am loving the podcast. And you have no idea, you know, how far the outreach of this message has been going. I was at a place in uh, Wisconsin just this past week speaking, and it was really cool because I was having dinner with a family that um, had helped bring me in for an event that I was speaking for. And they had invited a a young uh, man by the name of Noah over. And it was kind of cool. He's like, man, I just kind of can't believe you're sitting here. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I've been listening to you, you know, through the podcast. It's really neat to see the effect that this message is having is it's reaching out in any anyone from, you know, 15 years of age to 90. I mean, I'm getting messages saying, man, keep this going. I need this so much. And uh, you know what? I do, too, because it's my passion and it's part of the purpose that God gave me. And I am so honored to be able to bring this to you each and every week. And I want to say something, you know, my producer, Eric Foley, um, who you hear his voice at the beginning of the podcast, he came down, I don't know how people want to say he came down, but he had to have some emergency surgery done here uh, just about two weeks ago. And so we kind of had to put another podcast in that we had previously recorded, and he had to get some time away. But he is here in the studio today, but you will not be hearing his voice. Just kind of hoping that he can make it through the podcast because he's on pain meds and he's not doing real good. But, man, he is a warrior and he is here with us. So keep him in your prayers, if you would. His recovery would just keep on moving forward. So the question we have this week comes from Tom right here in Indiana, back home again. Anyhow, you probably don't even know that song. But the question was, do you respect, you know, a a hunter any less if he, you know, shoots a smaller buck and say something that's not over 150 inches? No, I don't. You know, it depends on what that hunter's goals are, you know, why he's out there. I mean, me being in the hunting industry somewhat, I do think about maybe targeting a little bigger bucks because I'm thinking about, you know, things that will help promote my sponsors like Bear Archery or Atsco or Grim Reaper Broadheads or some of these different companies I work with. But I, I want to put meat in my freezer, too. So I'm, you know, I'm taking does every year to feed my family. But you know what? If a guy, if he wants to go out there and shoot something that's like, you know, 100, whatever, whatever, whatever his target is, um, that's up to him. I don't respect him any less. I'm, I'm glad he's out there. So just kind of figure out what it is that you want to do. And don't respect or, or, or disrespect a hunter any, any more or any less because of what his goals, whatever they are, they're his. And I do respect that. So. Anyhow, leading into where we're going today is about respect. So in my book, The Roar Within, I talk about um, the big five man killers. And and I had done a poll, and I I mentioned this before, um, of about 400 guys. And I said, hey, out of these, you know, 10 things, what are the top five that really bother you the most, the enemy that hits you the most? And the last two weeks, we've gone over um, lack of purpose. We did a part one and part two. But on the next... uh, Uh, four episodes, we're going to go right down through the rest of the big five man killers. And man killer number two um, is disrespect. And I gave this, you'll see in in the book, I gave it to the lion um, with disrespect. But I'll explain that in a couple of minutes, why I gave that um, to the lion when you think about disrespect. But I want to go back and I want to see how many of you can remember there was a hit song that R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Remember that song by Aretha Franklin um, in 1967? Well, that song became a driving force of the women's movement in the late 1960s, but I'll bet most of you didn't know that that song was originally released by Otis Redding in 1965, which was two years before Aretha ever sang it. Otis, you know, he wrote that song. This is kind of interesting when I read about this. It was a cry to his wife telling her that what he desperately needed from her was her respect. I mean, how tough would that be to know that you had written a song wanting your wife to know how deeply you desired her respect, only to have a woman take your song, tweak it to, to meet her needs, and have it become one of the most popular songs of the women's movement. That's pretty crazy. But if you find yourself needing a woman's respect, you know, to feel good about yourself, and what you're getting is her D-I-S-R-E-S-P-E-C-T, you might want to have... Uh, you know, your doctor get you right now on some heavy dose of antidepressants because giving any woman or anyone else that kind of power over you holds you captive to their opinions on any given day. 
So what I kind of want to get into here is that R-E-S-P-E-C-T. You see, men don't struggle with that. They don't struggle with respect. They struggle with their need for respect. You know, they think that if they're given the respect that they believe they need and deserve, then the answer, do I have what it takes, which we've talked about in previous episodes, will be a resounding yes. But when a man feels disrespected, he feels like he's just had his shorts dropped in front of the whole gym class. I've had that done. And like in that moment, like your shortcomings have been exposed. But the message of the arrows that just hit him, you know, when he feels disrespected is you don't have what it takes. You are not enough. And I know so many guys I've, you know, I've talked to out there like, man, how do I deal with disrespect? You know, whether it be guys that I work with or, you know, my wife or my kids. See, that disrespect, you guys all know what I'm talking about, how that can be that, like a spark that ignites the flame, that lights the fuse, that sets off the fireworks, that if it isn't trampled out immediately, you know, there's going to be something's going to explode, right? You know, like we talk about here on Unleashed every single week, when a man doesn't know where his one true identity comes from, the smallest thing can strike that match. Um, so each week, we, we always go into the wilds, and we talk about some crazy story, and then we kind of wrap it back around and come back to the home front. So I want to go back to the dark continent of Africa this week. And I was sitting around a campfire one night, and we were talking about, you know, some of the hunting guides and things over in Africa. And there was a, there was a, a couple of guys that, that used to be special forces, and they, they're... they're um, Their main, what I want to say, their expertise was in really, you know, tracking, you know, taking down, you know, big game, taking guys on this really dangerous game hunts. One of the guys um, used to be, I I think it was a PKA champion fighter, and another guy was a weightlifting champion. But what was so unique about this story is they were telling this story is there had been a lion that had been coming in and attacking some villagers in this small village in Africa. And the villagers somehow like shot it with rock salt or some crazy thing with a shotgun and wounded this lion. Well, you know, a wounded lion can be really dangerous. So you've got to, you know, got to be able to find out where it went. So these two guys go back into the, the long grass in Africa. If you've ever been in it, I mean, it's really tall. You really can't see through it very well. So when you're tracking a wild animal, it, it can be really um, unnerving. I mean, I've been over there. I've had, you know, we have little Jack Russell Terriers that'll track game after we, we've shot them to get in there first. And then they'll start barking and letting you know whether the game has been down or whatever. But there's all, I mean, there's, there's, there's puff adders, there's black mambas, all kinds of, of crazy things. But these guys, as they were tracking this, both being special forces, you know, they're being incredibly quiet. And they're using hand signals. You know, when they're stopping, they're putting the fist up. You've got one guy down who's actually tracking this wounded lion through the long grass. And you have another guy who's, who's standing tall. He's got his 470 Nitro Express, and he's watching to see if the grass begins to move in front of them so they can see where this lion is. Well, the thing with a lion is they will let out a huff to let you know when they're charging. They'll just let out this, this crazy loud huff, and they, they really can, can move fast, way faster than you're thinking they can move. You know, when you're talking a full-grown male lion being up to like 600 pounds. But as the lion is going through the long grass, the one thing is that when he's moving straight, he doesn't think he's being tracked. He'll keep a straight line going. But once he knows that something is on his tail, he'll begin to serpentine right going through the long grass and throwing you off. And as soon as the the one guy down on the ground tracking realizes that he knows the lion knows he's being tracked, he immediately puts his fist up in the air and stops his other buddy to his right. Well, it wasn't a matter of seconds. He knew it was coming. He hears the huff. He stands up to shoot. Here comes the lion flying at him. And his buddy spins around with the 470 Nitro Express, pulls the trigger right as the lion hits his buddy in the chest, shoots the lion through the chest, but the bullet mushrooms go through his thigh, literally the size of a Coke bottle, and knocks him down. And the lion ends up you know, mauling, mauling him pretty good on his back. But here's the thing. A wounded lion, if you keep pushing it, it's going to lash out. That's what's going to happen. It's that way with, with any wounded animal. And it's the same thing with us. When a man has these, these wounds, maybe from childhood, maybe he's felt disrespected by the, you know, the buddies in his neighborhood or at school, like I said, maybe someone dropping his shorts. You keep pushing him, he's going to lash out. And so then how does that kind of you know, tie back into where we're going today with bringing things back to the home front? 
And I was, I was thinking about this as I was preparing this message. And I'm sitting there going, man, when was a time that, that all of a sudden I really felt like I was kind of being pushed to my limits? And you know, when COVID happened back in 2020, you know, being a speaker and a writer, I had a new book that was ready to come out. They pushed the, the release date of the book back. You know, you kind of feel disrespected a little bit when everything of yours is now being pushed to the back burner, you know, all that kind of self-worth value questions you begin to have. But what ended up happening was with COVID, when 18 months worth of speaking events literally canceled in one day, it took a couple of months to catch up thinking maybe the COVID will be over. But when it wasn't, I remember my wife coming to me, Stacy, and saying, you know what? I think you're going to have to find another job, you know, where you're not going to be respected for what you, you know, what you do or who you are. Now, I talk about, you know, not getting my worth and value from my performance or what other people think about me. And this was one of those times where I really got to be tested to see, you know, can I really put that into practice? And I'll tell you what, when I got pushed to the end with the finances and everything that, that you were hoping would come back didn't, it absolutely put me into this place where when I had to go start looking for other jobs that, that you would never think this way on a good day, but maybe you would think we're below you what you do somehow or not. It, maybe the right word is they don't tap into what your, your passions or, or, or what your talents are in. I just kind of felt like I was spinning my wheels and I was beginning to you know, lose hope. And, and I started going into some depression stuff. And I'm like, man, where did this coming from? So I went to a job interview. Now, this is kind of funny. Up in Gas City, Indiana, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of that. That name cracks me up. You know, Gas City must be the, I think must be the bean capital of the U.S. <laughs> it's the only city, I think, where people leave their car windows rolled down 24-7. Human flatulence, that's what I meant. Anyhow, did I really say that? I did. But, you know, it's kind of funny. I was reading an article. My son was in the car with me, Garrett. He was probably about 24, 25. And I was reading this article about, you know, cancer treatments that they can do. And somehow they found out that whatever the chemical, you know, stuff is inside of human flatulence, it actually has benefits for cancer treatments. So I'm telling my son this in the car and I hit the child lock on the windows, rolled the windows up and I said, get ready for your chemo treatment. <laughs> he never let me forget that. But it's, it was kind of funny, but you know, it's, Driving down Interstate I-69 from Gas City, I'm coming home and I'm like, man, you know, they, they did offer me this job, but I'm going, gee, it's going to be like a 40 minutes drive each way. The, the money wasn't very good. It was something that, you know, it's not my, where my, my gifts were in, but I'm thinking, you know, I got to support my family. And as I'm feeling this kind of backed into a corner with what I'm going to be able to do, I like, you know, I think a lot of us did, I'm passing these three semis. And as I'm going past the first one, I look in my rearview mirror, and here comes this guy probably doing 100, 110 miles an hour on this little Mercedes. He's got sunglasses on, a little driving gloves kind of thing, and he comes flying up behind me. And I mean, he is so close. He's not like three car lengths. He's three feet off of my bumper. Now, the speed limit was 70. The semis were doing like 67. I'm maybe doing 72, trying to get around 73, just kind of keeping a good pace just so I can get around these guys. But I, it's going to be a little bit before I can get around three semis. And he is right on my bumper. And I started feeling disrespected. I mean, like, dude. I mean, there was nobody with me, so I wasn't worried about, you know, somebody else being in a wreck. But, hey, you're going to cause a wreck. You're going to kill somebody here. Why are you disrespecting me like this? I don't know how many of you have ever interpreted that, like with drivers, when they can, maybe they'll pull out into an intersection in front of you, and then they tell you you're number one, right? They flip you off, and you're like, dude, what is your problem? And you start to feel that fight or flight kind of stuff kick up because you feel disrespected. Why did you need, feel the need to do that? So I'm feeling this and the guy comes up behind me and he's just flying. And I'm thinking, man, what do I do? Do I, oh, I slow down and take him off now? That's not going to help the matter. And it's going to make us both even matter. Do I, you know, um, do I, you know, pull over a little bit and let him go around me kind of on the, in the passing lane and, you know, flex a little bias up. You want a piece of this? Or, you know, or tell him he's number one, whatever. Or oh, turn on your windshield wiper fluid. I've done that before, especially if it's a convertible. I'm not proud of that, but I did it. Hey, it worked. But as this guy is coming up behind me, I'm getting madder and madder. And as I go to go around the last guy, I feel the Holy Spirit speak to me. And, you know, when you know God's voice and he's speaking to you, you know, it's always that, that voice of reason. 
Now, I'm not saying that it's always going to be a, a safe voice, because is, God is a safe God in some instances, but there's a righteous anger where you don't want to be on the wrong side of that. You know, I'm seeing what's happening in Israel right now, and I think we're getting to that point. I mean, you can go back and look at Zechariah 14 or whatever, but we're seeing things happening now where I think we're going to be seeing um, some really dangerous times, but I do think we're going to be seeing the glory of God through all this. Um, Anyhow, moving back over to where we were with this driver. So I, I feel the Holy Spirit speak to me, and he says, just slowly get out of the way and let him go around you. I'm like, but he's being a jerk. And God says, do you know his story? Do you know why he might be, you know, flying up behind you like this? I mean, maybe he just lost his job. You know, maybe he lost his marriage or lost his wife, lost a child. You have no idea what might be going on with this guy. And then he reminded me, God reminded me of some things in my own life, why I might have been driving like that at some point and realizing the other person may never know what it is. And so just get out of his way. It's his problem. And that disrespect and the anger coming out of that, that I was feeling as soon as I, I begin to renew my mind with, you know what, have empathy for this man, because you don't know what he might be going through, begin to subside. As I pulled over, I felt my blood pressure going back down. I let him go by. But how many of us allow that disrespect to eat us, you know, for lunch? You know, and here's another question. Where, where did, can this rear its head? Let's just take it back to maybe our marriages, right? You now, for many guys, it happens when our wives speak to us, you know, or they, they treat us with disrespect. You know, maybe you've asked your wife, you know, you know, honey, have you seen the ibuprofen for an example? And maybe she responds with, well, have you even looked for them yet? Probably not. You know, they're probably right in front of your face where I always find them. And it, you know, that usually goes over like a lead balloon, right? I mean, you begin to feel the disrespect. You feel like your wife, why are you talking like that? I got a bad headache. Can't you empathize with me? It might seem small, but for a man being spoken to disrespectfully like that, I mean, you know, for some guys that can be a trigger. You do not want to pull back. You know, his anger can explode if she's made a habit of speaking to him that way. And he has to learn how to be able to handle that. That's part of his responsibility. You know, who's the only one we can fix? Ourselves. But when a man understands that it's good enough doesn't come from his wife speaking to him with respect, you know, maybe instead of reacting in anger, he can choose to respond with something that's disarming, maybe even, maybe even charming, right? Like, um, like you're probably right. I can be horrible at seeing things right in front of my face. I'm so glad I have your gorgeous eyes to help this blind old man. Uh, that was a little bit maybe overboard, but I think it can somehow in that moment, it can kind of lighten things. I know the other night, uh, you know, my wife and I were sitting at a restaurant and we were having a discussion about something that, you know, was kind of keeping us both a little bit unsettled. And, you know, it's one of those things you have to talk through. And it, in those moments, sometimes I don't know what it is about the, the, the maleness. We want to win the argument, right? But the thing is this, if I have to win an argument or a discussion, I've already lost. And I, and I, I decided to go ahead and just kind of stop for a minute. I get up and I walk to the bathroom And I just kind of renewed my mind a little bit about, Brent, remember what maybe she's been going through and how what you're talking about has been affecting her. And I came walking back. And rather than sitting on my side of the the table, I sat down right beside her. And I just kind of slid up next to her and scootered in. And I saw her kind of crack a smile. But it's that kind of a thing that I'm talking about. You know, rather than maybe going overboard, it's those little things that just says to her, you know what, I know this is a problem right now but I want you to know how much I love you and that this is something that will pass and words can hurt. I don't want to go to my grave, you know, thinking thoughts like, man, I wish I'd have won another argument. I want to be able to, you know, finish this life well by saying, you know what? I loved well. And in those moments, I didn't have to be the one that would win. I was able to lay what I wanted down to be able to listen well to my wife, to my kids, my friends, whatever it was, because they have a story too. But, you know, responding in that way, like I just talked about, you know, it might help her see that she's been being disrespectful, like the ibuprofen comment. But even if it doesn't help immediately, there's a better chance, you know, that her respect for you is going to increase if you're not returning her disrespect. You know, just kind of let that sink in for a second. If I can do something like that, it's actually going to cause her to respect me more because she can see I didn't have to win. 
And I don't know about you guys, but if I'm not on my A game, um, you know, my wife, my kids, I mean, anybody for that matter that treats me disrespectfully, you know, I, I'm one of those guys, I don't usually lash out in anger. I don't, I'm not the, you know, the guy that throws stuff, raises my voice. You know, when I kind of get to my limit, and I think some of you can relate to this, I go quiet. You know, I call it, I call it going dark. And I, I, I'm not saying it's healthy, but I think it's healthier than going off on someone and trying to, you know, make them respect me. But neither one of those, you know, those things is, is really healthy. You know, when I'm, I'm quiet inside, because really there's two things going on. I'm angry and I'm hurt. I mean, those two things are like cousins. They go together. When someone is angry, chances are somehow underneath the hood, they've been hurt. Um, you know, we, we can feel betrayed. You know, like those closest to you should be your greatest ally. That's the way we feel. And if they treat us poorly, you know, we can begin to buy into the lie that, you know, we must not be good enough, you know, or they're not going to be treating us that way. So let's create another situation for a second. Let's say that, uh, let's say you're sitting at the dinner table and you've got a 13-year-old, and you can relate to that many of you, that, that talks back to you. Um, I remember a buddy of mine telling me one time years ago that he got lippy with his mother and it, he, he was telling me that she responded with, I brought you into this world. I'll take you out. You know, the, the temptation when someone pushes us, you know, that, that winning the argument thing we talked about, um, we, have to, we have to be able to lay that down, not trying to control them with a, a statement coming back to shut them down. That's one form of trying to win an argument. You know, when I, I brought you into this world, I'll take you out. That's trying to control, you know, someone's actions. And a lot of times what it does is it makes them feel even worse about themselves, that they're not really worthy of your time to get into their world and find out maybe what was really going on underneath the hood. And I always, I always call those things like um, withdrawals from a bank account. You know, when you, when you make a withdrawal from a bank account, it takes a number of deposits to get back to where that account was. Because what you're doing is you're, you're draining the trust account with your child. You have to remember, they're a kid. You know, they, they don't have all the wisdom and experience that you have yet. And so it's really important to help them see that their worth and value doesn't come from, you know, those kind of things that maybe they've done bad. And remind them of who they really are, saying, you know what, I can hear you're really upset right now. And I, I know that's not the real you speaking. I know there must really be something going on. And if you're ready to talk about it, I'd love to hear what's going on. Now, it doesn't mean that you're, you're laying down and just saying, you know what, you're not getting disciplined for that, because I think discipline is really, really important. But we, as adults, have to be so careful to under, help them understand where their worth and value comes from and not try to manipulate them, you know, to try, their, try to control their thoughts you know, or their actions just so that we can feel like, like we won. So, you know, it's, it's so deadly when we get our identity from anything else other than from Christ in us. I mean, it doesn't mean you don't, like I said, discipline the child, but it does mean that rather than lashing out in anger, which can be a, a verbal consequence, you know, using something like shame. You can let them know, I mean, that what they did was hurtful. Again, but you want to know what it was that was causing them to act out that way before you give them the consequence. You know, you can say something like, you know, wow, the way you just spoke to me was pretty hurtful. You know, I'm kind of wondering what, what made you, you know, respond that way. And chances are, you know, when you ask them, can you help me understand you're going to see them begin to soften, begin to lighten, because they're expecting you to somehow use that verbal or physical consequence toward them rather than saying, I care about you enough to try to understand what's going on. Um, really funny story happened the other night. Stacy and I, I don't remember, it was about a week ago, and it was maybe 10, 15 at night. We go to bed pretty early, and we're laying there, and Emma, our youngest, was, was in her room just around the corner from our bedroom. And we can hear this, this crying, you know, crying going on in the other room. And we're like, oh, really? We're trying to go to bed. I mean, and she's 14, you know, so it was like, okay, 14-year-old crying like that. What's, what's going on? And so she gets up and she, she leaves the room for about five minutes. And I can hear, you know, the crying. I can hear a little bit of a raised voice, you know, going back and forth here. And Stacy walks back in and she looks at me and I said, what's going on? And Stacy goes, she wants you. I'm like, oh boy, I'm like, what is going on? And so I get up, go in the room and she's sitting there crying. Tears are pouring down her face. And rather than, you know, saying something like, okay, listen, your mom's got to get up at, you know, four, four thirty in the morning. What are you doing? We got to get this. 
I just sat down and I'm not always like this. I wish I could say I was. I'll be honest here. Sometimes I can be on my A game, but sometimes I'm not. This was a good night. And I sat down on the ground beside her, right on the, on the bottom of her bed. She was on the floor, and I, I got down right down there with her. I think it was good. That's another thing, too, is when you're talking with your kids, get to the level where they are. Don't make them feel like they're below you in that moment, like you've got power over them. It's so important that you're just looking eye to eye with them. And I just looked at her, and I said, hey, babe, I said, what's going on? And she was, first she was like mad with her mother. No, she, I want to know how to do French braids, and she doesn't know how to do it, and she can't teach me. And I said, well, I said, you know, you know, you know, your mom, you know, your mom's story, you know, she um, didn't have a, a mom for the most part growing up after the age of eight, you know, she never had a mom and she never learned how to do that stuff. I know she loves you. And she looks at me and, I, and I'm like, so why did you call me in here? She goes, because I don't know how to do French braids. Now, if you can't see me, I'm bald. And I said, you want me to help you with French braids? What is that all about? And so she starts to, you know, laugh. And so I just kind of began to ask her what was really going on. And it didn't take long to get kind of below the surface. Whatever it was, it was really bothering her. But you can't get to that place underneath the hood unless you're willing to um, bring calm to the situation, some peace to the situation, and really ask, you know, what's, what's going on? What am I not seeing here? I want you to know I love you. I'm right here no matter what it is. And as long as you want me to sit here and talk with you, I'm going to be here. It took probably 30 minutes and eventually, you know, everything went great and went to bed. And I got up the next morning and I go downstairs and I'm standing against the kitchen counter and I'm making coffee. And I can hear her come down the stairs. I'm talking about Emma, the 14-year-old. I hear her come down. And she comes walking up from behind me. And I'm thinking, it's kind of early. She's not like a practical joker in the mornings. What is she doing? And I kind of like look over my shoulder and I see these big doe eyes. You know, she's got these big eyes and she's looking up at me. And I turned around and she just lays her head on my chest and she puts her arms around me and just starts hugging me. And Emma's not a hugger like that. And, you know, it's one of those, you know, for guys, we, we're not quite sure sometimes what to do with our emotions. You know, for men, we can feel joy, you know, like football game excitement or anger because it feels more masculine. But sometimes those tender things, you know, to be able to, you know, I, I, I honestly, I was so moved that she came up and put her arms around me, that she initiated it, that I about lost it. I about started crying. And I just put my arms around her and I just, just held her. And I looked at her hair. I kind of, you know, stood back and she had put what she called bubble braids. I think that's what she called them. She'll probably kill me after this if I get it wrong, but she had them all done. Her hair looked great, but that was the whole thing. Remember a man's question. Now, do I have what it takes but a woman's question is, am I enough? And a lot of times it comes through her, her beauty. You know, the man wants the respect thing we're talking about. It's kind of that same thing with a woman, but her question, like a man, do you see me? Do you see all the things that I do? But her question, do you see me? Not just my beauty, but do you really see me? It's, it's like a form of respect in that way. So let's go back just for a moment to that biblical uh, relationship we were talking about a little bit ago with a husband and a wife. You know, there's no question that wives are instructed in Scripture to respect their husbands. But men, we can't control that. You know, if you're a man who's attempted to do that feat, let me ask you a question. How's that working for you? It usually doesn't. You know, the more a man thinks he's got to have respect um, to be okay with himself, the more he's going to try to get others, you know, to do what he wants or believes that he deserves. You know, the more we, we try to force others to respect us, the less they're actually going to respect us. You know, when you tell a child, don't you touch that stove, what's the first thing that child wants to do? Yeah, he wants to touch the stove. In any relationship, you know, if a man tries to force others to respect him, do they respect him more or less? You know, we know that when a man feels respected, um, well, at least for me, at least, I think it goes for all of us, when we feel respected, it's encouraging it's like, yes, you could slay the dragon. Uh, you give me one word of encouragement, and I'm telling you, it will last me for a long, long time. You know, it, it adds to what I, I feel is my, that, that intrinsic worth and value that I have that God put me here for. Respect is a powerful thing. What's that book? Um, 
love and respect. I think that was it. The love she so desires and the respect, I think the, the subtitle says, and the respect he so desperately needs. You know, there's, there's a lot of truth in that. Absolutely there is. The thing I think we have to be careful of and look at is that respect he so desperately needs. The more I'm, I'm needing someone's respect, the less I'm really seeing my one true worth and value, which comes from Christ in me. So what's, you know, what's that um, solution to that problem that we have, you know, with respect? See, when respect becomes an idol to me, and I put that in, in, in front of, of my worth and value with Christ, it conflicts with who Christ is in me, and they begin to fight against each other. And until we get that settled, we're going to struggle with, with anger every single time we feel disrespected again. So what's the solution to that problem? The simple answer is you don't need respect. Well, how do you do that, right? See, as long as your worth and value is connected to your desperate need for respect, you're going to be stuck on the hamster wheel of performance. And like I've said before, we all know what snakes do to hamsters. You have an enemy who wants you dead, and he is absolutely going to keep you on that wheel of performance so you never, ever truly walk into who you are in Christ. It's only when you can embrace that your worth and value comes from your identity in Christ that you were already good enough because the God of the universe is in you and that's what sets you free from having to need respect. When that, when that light goes on, I'm telling you, the chains of needing other people's respect begin to fall off, and you can step out from behind the bars you've been holding on to for so long that's held you captive, and finally experience the freedom that we talk about in Christ and be exactly who it is that God created you to be. You know, the thing I always say is, you know, remember that when a man knows who he is in Christ— that he's been created in the image of the living God, when he's no longer held captive by the opinions of others or cares whether he lives or dies, he's extremely dangerous. Dangerous for good because he's been unleashed. Guys, remember, as we talk every single week, you know, we are the resistance. So what am I saying by that? Once we get these weapons that we need to have on how to renew our mind, our identity in Christ, and we begin to put these things into play, into work, into our lives, into our wives, into our children, into the people around us, you're going to be seeing your relationships begin to change. This is what it looks like when we're making disciples. It's about relationship. And that relationship begins with the one who made us and has set us free, free to be unleashed. We are the resistance, guys. See you next time.